Hello, and welcome to a special Masters with Masters. We're here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and we're here to talk and have a discussion with two distinguished practitioners and professionals. I'm Ed Hoffman, the NASA Chief Knowledge Officer, and I'll be your host. I also want to start by thanking the folks at JPL, particularly our JPL Chief Knowledge Officer, David Oberhedinger as well as his colleague, uh, Min Lee, who's the Knowledge Management Specialist here, the Public Relations Office, and NASA TV. The sessions today are here to provide uh, a discussion format to share knowledge and lessons and promote more reflection across the agency uh, and help us with the execution of the missions that we have. The sessions are also designed to be interactive, so we have an audience here who will have an opportunity to ask questions to the folks that we're, we're talking with today. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the, uh, the professionals we have here, and reading the, uh, the backgrounds, reading the interviews, it's uh, stunning accomplishments. Uh, I'll start with Jan Chodis, who's currently the Director of the Office of Safety and Mission Success. Jan's had a long and successful career at NASA and at JPL. Previous to her current position, she served as the Project Manager for the Juno mission to Jupiter here at JPL. Jan's been at JPL since 1980 and has had a diverse career uh, leading the systems and software division for both flight and ground systems, uh, the flight software team for the Mars Exploration Rover, the Space Interferometry Mission Team, and the Galileo AACS Operations Team for the launch and the first Venus flyby. She has uh, too many uh, awards for me to, to take the time, which spend all the time going through the awards. Uh, but she's involved in all aspects of the mission and the programs and projects, and I'd welcome and thank Jan for being here. Thanks, Ed. Also want to introduce uh, Jim Erickson, who's the project manager for the Mars Science Laboratory. Uh, and uh, recently, he was the, the uh, project manager for the NASA Mars Exploration Rover. Over a remarkable period of approximately 30 years, he's worked the Galileo mission, Viking missions, uh, to Mars, the Voyager missions, to the outer planets, uh, and the Mars Observer mission. Uh, he's also been involved in uh, many awards, including the prestigious Nelson P. Jackson Aerospace Award from the National Space Club and a recipient of NASA's Outstanding Leadership Award. And again, as with Chan, uh, numerous, numerous uh, awards. It's an honor uh, and a pleasure to, to talk with you in terms of the experiences you've had. And I think the starting point is probably to, how did you get here? And I'll start maybe with Jan. Uh, how did you uh, get to JPL and what are some of the key uh, accomplishments that you've had in terms of, uh, in terms of your career getting started? Well, actually, that's an interesting um, perspective because I'm a Canadian citizen originally. Came, uh, got my degrees at University of Toronto. Uh, I came down to JPL in 1980, um, intending to only stay for two or three years. But I uh, began my career as a dynamics and control analyst on the Galileo Attitude and Articulation Control Subsystem, and I never left. I mean, the work here is just fascinating. It's uh, one of a kind. You don't get to do it anywhere else. So. Uh, now I'm a dual citizen, U.S. and Canadian, and uh, I've enjoyed living here and, and working at JPL. There you go. Usually I get international folks who say, how do I work at NASA? And I've always told them you can't. Now you <laughs> proved me wrong. I saw you, you, you agrees from Toronto, University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And so uh, working, getting involved in the work. And so originally it was a couple of years. Was it, what, a detail? Or how did you, how did you even get started? Uh, well, I was on an exchange visitor's visa, which uh, in the days was uh, a method of being able to come down for two to three years to uh, work at a university, Caltech, since we're Caltech employees. Right. And uh, I got interested in um, the space uh, field um, probably throughout uh, high school and then especially in, uh, in my university years when I specialized in aerospace engineering and dynamics and control in particular of spacecraft. So JPL the was things, the place to be. Right. One of the things your career also demonstrates the importance of different kinds of assignments uh, in, in terms of taking to different places. Certainly at JPL, I've been involved in uh, various flight project positions throughout the project life cycle from early formulation through implementation and operations. I've been involved in 
line management roles at various levels at the section and the division. And in fact, um, my current position is really a line manager position in the Office of Safety and Mission Success. Previously, I was in a project position as the Juno project manager. Right. And I know that there we'll, we'll get to some of the challenges. Let me, uh, let me uh, invite Jim into the discussion. Um, how did you get to JPL and uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what, what kept you here and what, what, what proceeded with your career? Well, uh, it started when I was a starving college student and I needed money to pay the rent and pay the uh, tuition. So you came here for the money? Came here for the money. <laughs> Don't usually get that. But. Um, it was basically a summer, summer job in 1974, I think, 74, something like that. And uh, sort of when I got done with the summer, it was a really good job. I enjoyed it a lot. And they said, well, can you work a little bit while you're going to school? And I said, sure. Sounds like fun. And then when I graduated, they, my boss said, well, while you're looking around for a job, how'd you like to work on Voyager? Mm. Um, and I said, okay, okay. And I never left. Every time I even thought about it, some new and more interesting job came up, and um, there's never been a reason to leave. Right. Sounds both of you have a, a common starting point in that maybe you didn't have your career planned out that you're going to work at JPL at NASA, but you started here with different work assignments uh, out of uh, academia, and the work just pulled you into it. Yeah, so. pretty much. I, uh, I had originally planned to be in nuclear physics and most likely at the bottom of the ocean in a uh, U.S. Navy uh, submarine, but when I had a chance to work here during the summer, it just changed things. So I hurriedly went away from nuclear physics at, at my college and uh, went off to see how much engineering I could cram in in one more year. So. And, uh, you know, getting a career started at, at JPL, what are some of the, the challenges that you've seen? And are there, are there common themes across the different missions that you, you've been involved with? Things that you know you're going to encounter, things you have to prepare for, um, and uh, issues that kind of separate, you know, being successful from, you know, maybe not being able to, to be as effective. Uh, what do you see as some of the, the challenges, Jan? Well, I think some of the challenges of a project um, are definitely uh, on the technical side. You want to have uh, clear requirements for your project or your system or subsystem, and ideally they're stable. In other words, after you've committed to a cost and a schedule, the requirements remain consistent and aren't changing on you or out from under you. Um, going along with that, uh, most of our missions here are um, targeted towards a planetary launch period because we often fly to the other planets. Uh, even for an Earth orbiter, we're targeting a particular time of year, for example, for when we want to launch the spacecraft. And so having a well-planned schedule with lots of schedule resiliency, especially when you get down to the um, assembly test and launch operations period, you want to make sure we call that the ATLO flow. We want to make sure that you have a lot of different paths that you can follow during that period of time so that you can hit that uh, end date target uh, successfully. So both the requirements and the schedule are critical. Having adequate uh, budget and sufficient reserves um, at your fingertips is really important. Um, and then I should really point out that what makes it all happen is a strong team. You know, as Jim and I both know, as the project manager, you don't get to do any of the fun work. It's really the team that, that makes your project happen. And so having a, a really strong um, mix of experience and uh, less experienced people who can be mentored along the way is really beneficial. And there's always the, uh, the fact that you may encounter a situation where you just don't have the right person in the right job and not being afraid to make a change both for the better of the project and the better of that person is a, a critical aspect of, of our jobs that we face. Right. So the requirements, the scheduling, the planning, uh, the, the team, you know, the team component, I know that's something that uh, you indicated you'd want to talk a little bit more about. Um, let, me, let me turn it to you, Jim. What do you see as some of the consistent challenges that you face and, you know, what, what's the difference between a successful project or a project manager and someone who is not as successful? Um, partly it's because whenever we do our missions, we're usually going to some place 
and you almost have to expect surprises. So there has to be a lot of flexibility in both the plans that you make and what you do afterwards. Um, like Jan said, we have to have teams that are capable of responding to what the reality is, not what you thought it was going to be before launch. Um, making that happen and yet not losing sight of the fact that you have to have controlled flexibility. Um, you've got to be able to keep the project going on a, in a particular direction that needs to go, but at the same time you've got to have things that are exciting for the team and the opportunity for the team to adjust to whatever the facts are on the ground. So you've got to have a good team, you've got to keep them flexible, you've got to keep them aligned with the direction that they have to be in, and that sort of sums up how the internal parts of the project have to work. The thing that you have to keep in mind is you've got to keep the team aligned, and that has to mean that you not only tell them what's going on, but they have a chance to make sure that what you want to do is what you ought to be doing. And as the Jan said, they're the people that do the work, and they frequently know a lot more about what the work is than you do. So. He used a term that I hadn't heard before, controlled flexibility. So it sounds, um, in essence, when you're working these missions, you have to be innovative because you're adapting to, to, to the changes. You know, things aren't going to be able to go as planned. But at the same point, you need to maintain a, a certain discipline or a, or a focus. So how do, you, how do you do that? How do you, I mean, do you try to plan in innovation at the beginning in terms of how you're going to look for opportunities to innovate or and how then do you you work off of there are certain consistent things that we know in the past have worked I mean is there a balance that you think about or is it just something that happens well there's a little bit of everything that you've just mentioned probably a good way to do it is to use some some examples on MER and MSL most of the rover missions you sort of plan that you're going to change how the ops process works before launch even and when you get there, you begin trying to execute the plan that you had forward. Example, for the first 90 days on both missions, the intent was that we would work Mars time, which is very difficult on people's home lives and their, and their health, so you have to have a limit on how long you do it, but in the beginning of the mission, you don't know how long the vehicle will last. You've got to get the most out of it you can. And so at some point, though, you say, it's time to step back, you have a plan you're going to do it after 90 days. You have a plan how you're going to step back through the different levels of intensity that you're using with the vehicles. But the facts on the ground may dictate that it's not going to be 90 days, it's going to be 95. Or it's too tough right now, we've got to do it at 80. Those are just examples of how you might have to have both the flexibility and the control over how you're going to do it. And that extends to other things like flight software changes. After you've been on the surface for a while, you may actually have a better idea of what the vehicle should be doing. And you want to make those changes, but just like pre-launch, you want to go through a process that allows for the creativity and the new software and the new capabilities, but done in the controlled manner that we've found works very well here at JPL. Configuration management, even when you're trying to wing it and rea react to what the, the vehicle's finding on Mars, is still necessary. Yeah, so it's a, it's a mixture of a disciplined approach that you know you're going to employ, but at the same point you indicate that going in, you know with the team that we need to, to have the ability to adapt and to change and, 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 and the ability to, to respond to you know, different opportunities or challenges that come up. Yep. Um, in, in leading the, the Juno team, how do, you, how do you build a team that's, uh, that's able to do both, be disciplined, be innovative, without going uh, you know, crazy? How do you, how do you get a team that responds the way that you feel it, it needs to go? Well, I think that um, we've both mentioned how important a team is. And I know um, on uh, several of the teams that I've worked on, the, my Galileo and Cassini experience, uh, MER, um, the uh, current uh, experience I have in line management, but also on the Juno team, um, you look for a team that is um, efficient, is communicating, is uh, reacting well, but also that um, have a great camaraderie, they have fun together, they enjoy each other's company, they look forward to coming to work every day, you spend a lot of time with these folks. Um, so one um, way to look at that is to come up with a um, 
an, a, 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 a prescription for teaming behaviors, and one that's very popular in NASA is uh, the 4D systems approach um, developed by Dr. Charlie Pellerin. When I looked at that uh, 4D systems set of behaviors, uh, it's eight behaviors that are really common sense. You know, things like appreciating people, uh, resisting blaming and complaining, um, having clear roles and responsibilities, uh, working together with shared interests. You know, we want to explore Mars, we want to explore Jupiter together as opposed to um, a more combative relationship. And you can really tell when teams are, are working well and modeling those behaviors, they're working very efficiently and productively and happily, even despite long hours. They don't have energy drained away from them in terms of negativity or conflict. And so one way to look at um, a good team is to measure them against a, a behavioral yardstick, such as the, those behaviors. So it's part of like the mission, you're you're trying to understand the framework that you you're using, you know, in terms of in terms of the team component, the appreciation, the uh, sense of uh, understanding the goals, the vision, mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 ability to deal with the requirements, and now we know how we're going to move, and you can measure yourself off of that. Yes, and I really uh, value communication. I think that um, if, if you're not communicating, um, you flowing communication downwards to your team members, them com communicating back up to you, uh, communicating with your sponsors at uh, your program office and NASA headquarters, um, communicating with um, your subcontractors that you, ha that you may have on the, the mission, communicating with line management. At JPL, we have a, a matrix organization, and so we draw large numbers of our team members from our line organizations, and it's essential to be communicating with those managers to make sure, again, that we're all pulling together and have a common goal of having the mission succeed. In my mind, and I may be wrong, correct me, but I would think that if someone's working at JPL, you know, you're talking about Juno, you're talking about Galileo, you're talking about you know, all these great missions, Everyone who's going to work for you is going to be motivated. Is that uh, is that not? It's the a case? great start. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's. But you still, I guess, in any kind of situation, you're still dealing with human nature. So everything isn't always going to be perfect. I guess there's even in that case, or or is it? Uh, you know, once you get that mission, uh, you know, people are like you said. Uh, you're your student. You're you're being asked. Do you want to work Voyager? The reaction is. Yeah, uh, is, is it? Uh, I shouldn't say that easy because I don't want to make it sound easy. But it, you basically deal with people who are motivated, turned on, and is the the challenge more getting an agreement in terms of the direction to go, or is there also the part where you're dealing with, you know, uh, you know, people who maybe aren't always happy? I mean, I'll start with that. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a, like I said, it's a great start to know that most of the population in the lab is here for a reason and that they want to be here and they want to do the kinds of things that we like to do. That being said, everybody's going to have setbacks. I mean, say you're a flight software developer, you've got a tight schedule, at Lowe's running, you know you've got a launch window that opens in three months and you've got to finish the code and it's not cooperating with you. You're getting new requirements because they're finding problems in the at low flow you may have problems, you may decide, ah, this is a challenge, I, I'm stressed out, and you've got to keep everybody working even though that there are obstacles to get past. Um, it helps that everybody is usually aligned with what they want to do here at JPL, which is the space missions, but day-to-day -day reality bends, bends people, and it helps to be able to keep them focused on what they're supposed to be doing, and where necessary, make changes to accommodate whatever's happening. Sometimes you have to change how you're doing a job. You might have three or four coders and there just isn't enough being done in one area and you actually have to tell people, well, I know you like to do this, but I need you over here. And if we don't get the job done, we're not going to launch. And everybody loses then. So. You know, again, it's, it's like any kind of a situation. There's, there's the reality component, even though at a starting point you're dealing on work that is a dream and powerful vision and, and motivating. Yes, and I think that it's also critical um, to make sure that the folks on your team have the right 
experience and mentoring. And so you can get into situations where uh, someone may not have the right background or experience or time to learn, and that leads to stress in terms of wanting to accomplish their particular task because everyone is motivated, and yet you know, they, those stresses build up. And so watching for that and taking the temperature of your team, walking around, getting a feel for um, the, the temperament is really a, a good indicator, kind of a, a qualitative insight into how your team's feeling and, and how the stresses are building up and watching for that sort of thing, trying to nip it in the bud and making the corrections that you have to make early rather than late be yeah, proactive like anything. Right. project you want to identify issues or challenges early and then same thing with with a team um, we have an audience here and so we, we are getting some questions um, um, from the crowd here and I, I see one right on the top you know which is in, in line with what we're talking about which is what are some of the more interesting team building exercises that you use in your teams so are there things that you, you do? You mentioned the 4D, which is obviously a, a process and a way mm -hmm. of measuring. Are there other things that you do to, to naturally build a team? Uh, maybe I'll start with, you know, well, with you, that's Jan. A, that's an the... interesting question because um, we have a, um, a strategic planning thrust in the Office of Safety and Mission Success. And uh, our facilitator, who is one of our section managers, uh, John O'Donnell, um, is a, a trained um, facilitator for this sort of uh, team building and strategic planning um, organizational development aspect. And he, on our first meeting, had us come together. Uh, he had us sit in a circle facing outwards, and we were each given a rope to pull on. And we didn't know what we were doing, but we had one leader who could see what was happening in the center of the circle. And, and it turns out we were trying to, using these ropes and pulleys and hooks, stack two or three blocks on top of each other. So we had no idea what we were doing. We were facing out of the circle. And after 15 or 20 minutes, you know, frustration was building up. She, uh, the, the, our leader was firing people, you know, taking them off the job. Uh, someone was uh, intentionally told to cheat and, you know, and try to, try to not be uh, part of the team. And um, then after uh, we called a halt to that, we could turn around and see what lousy progress we had made. And then we did the same exercise, looking in the center of the circle and without even talking. I mean, previously it was all by verbal communication because we couldn't see. But by looking at it, we all could tell what part of the rope we had to pull and what we had to do to maneuver. And we accomplished the exercise, you know, in a few minutes. And so it was a really interesting practical demonstration of the benefit of communication and teamwork <clears throat> and sharing ideas and having a common goal and a, a shared focus. So that's one of the most explicit team building activities uh, that we've done. activity and mm -hmm. seeing how you would add and you build a sense of enjoyment for each other. And we could take through. lessons. We could apply, right. we could map that to our daily work and, and uh, really learn about how to, how to work well as a team. Right. What about you, Jim? Is there anything mm -hmm. that you... <clears throat> go in trying to do with a team or, or? Well, I would say that frequently you have some knowledge of what the team is like, um, either from past history on other projects or word of mouth from the person's supervisor. And you try and kind of get a concept of how the team's going to be built. Um, or if it's already running, how you may need to change it to shift the focus from getting development done to getting operations done. Um, I sort of spent a lot of time in that phase of the mission moving moving things from a development cycle to the actual on the surface or in orbit operations. And there, there are some people that work really well in the focused, I've got to get this done, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. And others that that begins to get boring for them and they'd like to see something actually being built or done or executed by the vehicle. And sometimes there's times for, for saying, okay, here's the kinds of things we need to do and getting the people to actually watch others do them um, is always a great way to start this going. And particularly if it's a new person, making sure that not only do they go through some training and go through some mentoring and Get, a, get some hands-on feeling, but then they get to tell you afterwards what doesn't make sense. And sometimes it's they don't understand how it's going, and sometimes it's a really important thing to change. 
but it wasn't obvious unless you came into it with, with no blinders on and no preconceived notions. So team building sometimes is taking what you've got and altering it to match what you need to do in the new phase of the mission. So. Right. So you know, understand, and I'm, you're probably both in a situation where in many cases you know, and you've probably known for many years, the people who are going to be working with you. And so it's the ability to, to adjust, see how things are going, and to keep that, that open door so that people know you're receptive and responsive to how things need to change. So we have um, uh, a question around innovation, which I think, Jim, you, you, you kind of got us started on. And, and the question is, what do you think is the best example of creativity and innovation in a project or a team here at JPL, past or present? And it was kind of targeted towards you. So that's kind of a large span <laughs> and a lot of great programs. Um, but is there anything that sticks out of, of uh, or, or tremendous innovation, innovative breakthrough or creative approach? or? Um, how, how about if I kind of limit it to the projects that I've been on that I have? The, yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I experienced on Galileo was a lot of frustration in a particular part of an extended mission where the vehicle was damaged by radiation, and every time we got this close to doing a flyby of Io, the vehicle would reset within 20 minutes before you did the flyby, and you'd lose the whole data from the whole orbit. Um, and there was only you know, 37 orbits total that were done by the, the, the mission. So each one was important. And we couldn't figure out what to do. We couldn't change the hardware. We couldn't figure out what, you know, how to make the software respond gracefully. So we finally said, okay, the only alternative is to basically tell the vehicle, when you see this thing go into a, to a reboot, ignore it. And everybody said, oh. Well, and then, and then the conversation would start about if that happens, how do you make the vehicle not be as vulnerable as you would think if it's ignoring all these different uh, types of reboots that we might have? And we eventually got it done so that we could actually have the vehicle survive the the radiation damage that it was getting, and actually execute the sequences when we did the flybys of the the moons. So that was uh, Tal Brady when he did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Sometimes the, the innovations are not exactly what you think. Sometimes it's just forgetting what you know and reacting just to what you have on the facts on the ground again. Probability sometimes to unlearn so that you can move forward. Yep. Right. Um, there's an interesting question here that I'll, I'll throw out to, to both of you, which, which um, one of the things we talk about in the work is that you're dealing with a lot of different partners uh, there's obviously the science, there's engineering, there's the management, there's, there's all different approaches. How do you handle the different voices on a project? Program office, the science community, your team, the public, safety. <laughs> how do you, and how do you build that? And how do you, um, how do you respond to the different, I guess, stakeholders? Is there an approach? Is there a plan? Is it something that you respond to at the time? Well, I, I would say that I'll go back to communication. Uh, one thing that I felt that was very important on the Juno develop during Juno's development was having um, a really good rapport with um, our program office, our um, program exec at headquarters, and um, the science mission directorate. And so um, having frequent communication, we ended up going back for um, a two to three hour uh, conversation, status conversation. Uh, every three or four months in the last couple of years to keep them informed so that they were on our side marching shoulder to shoulder towards the uh, successful uh, launch of the Juno spacecraft rather than in a combative, um, I didn't know that you were having these issues, you know, why didn't you tell me I could have helped, uh, that kind of thing. So I think communication is really important uh, with your sponsors. I think from the science community perspective, um, a really valuable lesson is to involve the scientists um, throughout the development so that, uh, for example, when you're making a trade study, you're considering um, a technical aspect of the trade, the um, cost and schedule implications of the trade, 
the risk perspective, you know, is this going to add risk to the project, lessen risk, but also what's the science implication and having um, your project scientist and your or, and or your principal investigator working shoulder to shoulder with you again helps build that common vision of, you know, here we're headed towards these things together, let's collectively make the best uh, decision with all the facts on the ground, including the science perspective. So there's common vision, com we're in it for the same thing, and communications right. that are, uh, uh, are on constant, and uh, you, you, you pull people in early. I've right. heard sometimes strategies years ago of people saying, don't let certain groups know until you have to, but that's oh, obviously totally not the way you want to do that. You want right. to get people on board early so there's right. no surprises. You build the trust and you have a team going forward. Exactly. Any thoughts in terms of the different stakeholders in terms of a mission? Or? It's important to have all the stakeholders holding hands when we jump off the cliff. Um, and or down through the atmosphere. Or down through yeah. the atmosphere. And it's also important to understand that there are different roles and responsibilities for all those different stakeholders. Headquarters is not simply the place where you go to get funds to make the project work. They actually have to help you integrate all the different voices, uh, the science, the different centers, all of whom have a vision of how your project is supposed to go and what they want to contribute and what they want to get out of it. And headquarters can actually help you discipline that and get the voices so still there. Surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, headquarters is, is different yeah. from decade to decade. So uh, probably the same is true of JPL. And people cycle through and different, do different jobs, and they do it different ways. And you have to adjust to that. But no matter what, you are going to have a valuable resource in headquarters in helping that out. Other centers can be a challenge. They have their own um, voices on what they'd like to do. Um, and getting a, and a different center or a different country team member integrated into the teams are always important. They're one of the areas that are the most likely to cause miscommunications, whether it's by distance, whether it's by language. Um, Anything's possible, and so you have to sort of pay attention to that. Um, that the fact that you can go off course easier there than anywhere else, but you also can't focus solely outside. You've got to make sure that your team is is marching along, pushing you forward as you go. So well, that's probably one of the both joys of working with so many such a broad community. I mean, there's an international community. There's obviously anything you do. You know, particularly nowadays, uh, you know, and from Twitter and Facebook, everyone sees what's going on, and you, you have your own communities that you have to deal with. So there's probably the, you know, when things are going well, there's probably a sense of joy, and when, when things go off a little bit, there's probably that frustration feeling uh, in terms of how to deal with that. Um, you've been through many different, you know, programs uh, and uh, line versus project. What are the core, if you were starting or when you start a, a mission now, if you're starting something new tomorrow, um, what are the key lessons that you would start with? Things that you, you think these are, you know, after 30 years, these are the things that I, I really want to make sure that, uh, that I'm focused on. I'll start with, with you because you go back to Voyager, so Voyager and Galileo and... <laughs> Uh, or, or is every, or you know, is every mission really significantly different, so that you don't have a, a template of a lesson or lessons? Actually, sometimes it changes with time. Okay. Um, if you're really starting out the ground floor and you're trying to develop a concept for a mission, you actually are going to need different kinds of people than you have that are either going to be doing the development of the software and the hardware when it's being built, and versus when it's operated. Um, but the team members that you choose are probably the biggest and most important choice that you will make throughout the life cycle of the project is who you hire to do the job, then who, how you integrate them into a team that functions well, and finally how to motivate them to not just enjoy being at JPL, but to enjoy doing the project that we need them to do. So, so your starting point is it's about the team, get the talent that you need for the mission, look at a way to get them integrated so they're going in the, the common you know, direction. And, uh, and, and the people that you're going to get change through the life cycle, whether you're 
trying to create what the project is and you need big strategic thinkers. When you're trying to actually build things, you need people that can analyze the requirements, write them correctly so that some, a developer can actually code to it or a designer can actually build it. And then finally, you've got to have enough of that people carry over into operations that you understand based on what you built and the testing that you did on the ground, how it's going to operate on the surface and recognize that it's not and it's doing something different and help decide how to fix it or how to use it the way it has to be used after you built it. So. Yeah, because your missions are going over like 20, 30 years. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> yeah, so the skills and the requirements change. So, I mean, Jan, what do you see as some of the, uh, the key lessons that you take? And you've also been in, you know, project situation and, you know, now you're in the safety kind of role. Do you see, do the lessons change based on where you're, where you're sitting or where you're leading? Well, I think Jim and I are both very strong on the team. You know, the team and your team members are really who make the project successful for you. And so selecting the right team members and making sure they have the right mentoring, um, experience bases, um, tools and techniques and processes to do their job is really critical. Um, and I think that maps over to the line organization as well. If you're in a, a line management position, you want to have the right team to carry out the um, nurturing of your, the, the, of your folks, um, making sure that they're um, evolving their processes and procedures to be um, increasingly um, techno te technologically savvy. You want to modernize your processes as the tools and, and um, systems that we have become um, more IT centric. You uh, you want to make sure that you have um, a good partnership with the projects. In fact, it's interesting being in this position because um, from the perspective of safety and mission success, we like to be an integral part of a project team. So you have the, the project folks, you have the engineering folks, and then you have the safety and mission assurance folks. We're really an integral part of the project team, yet we maintain an objective viewpoint from the safety and mission success perspective, just like the engineering team will maintain a, a technical objective um, perspective. Um, both sides making sure that the project manager is on track. <laughs> When I was the project manager for Juno, I really thought of my project systems engineer and my safety and mission assurance manager as kind of my right and left hands, making sure that uh, we work together to both from a technical safety and mission assurance perspective, risk um, embodying across the board, that we were all working hand in hand to make the project successful. So that carries over to the line organization as well. Probably helpful for the organization to have at different points playing different roles, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it gives a greater appreciation, you know, for the different positions that people have to play and you're able, able to probably adapt. I think that's that. definitely true. I think that having um, both line management and project role experience throughout your career is critical so that you can see both sides of the story. Right, I appreciate that. Um, I asked, yeah, Jim. And also when you're when you're thinking about different projects, having experience not just line versus project, but also development versus operations. Mm -hmm. Being able to understand, okay, I'm building this, somebody's gonna have to operate it is interesting, but having operated something that somebody else built, and then you get a chance to actually build the next one, you're much more likely to consider it from the operator's point of view if you do it that way. So getting a lot of experience and a broad experience in all the different things that we do here at JPL is very valuable. So. Currently, um, a, a new thrust that's across NASA and, in fact, industry is um, working different types, different classes of missions. You know, we were raised on the, the class A, B, C, uh, very risk adverse missions, um, flagships in the case yeah. of Galileo and Cassini. <clears throat> Nowadays, we have the Class D missions um, embodied in the limit by CubeSats, where uh, we want to be able to take a lot of risk in the development to keep the um, costs down and, and the schedule short. But we have to we have to really think critically about why we do the requirements that are in our process book and decide which ones we can give up on and only add an incremental amount of risk as opposed to giving up on a requirement that will add a lot of risk to your project. So 
getting experience across the, the class breadth of missions is, I think, even more important today than it has been in the past. You've shared uh, some of your thoughts in terms of the key lessons you have for yourselves. Uh, key things we always hear about is how effectively uh, does NASA you know, capture uh, lessons and share that, and, and basically are we a culture of learning, so we're adapting for new ways to, to do that. What are some of the things that you've seen effective at JPL or at NASA in terms of how we, how we share our knowledge and for new generations and for you know, uh, folks who will be working with us in the future? you have thoughts on that? I think that um, mentoring is a great way of sharing knowledge. Um, and we used to be able to, with larger teams, do more mentoring than we are able to do today. Uh, I think in terms of um, project management in particular, uh, some of the um, NASA-wide efforts that have been valuable to me are things like the Ask Magazine um, that NASA produces, the um, Project Management Challenge, the PM Challenge, was a, a great conference where project managers and aspiring project managers could get together and uh, discuss issues, hear from a panel of um, experienced project managers what worked, what didn't, kind of like the thing you're doing here with the yeah. Masters with Masters. Um, in fact, JPL is now um, revamping our project manager workshop to focus on what do project managers do? And so we're looking at it from the perspective of not the, the knowledge base that they need to know, because you can gain that more easily in a, some sense by, by reading a manual or, or going to a class, but really what do they do to make their job successful? And so that's another opportunity uh, once that uh, workshop is up and rolling uh, that we'll be able to benefit so by the learning, in our the community. Different articles, the sharing the different approaches. Any thoughts in terms of how do you uh, you're going to have people who are here for many, hopefully, uh, decades or generations. How do you prepare them for the future? Well, first, I'd like to second the PM challenge as being one of the best things that I've seen over time here. Um, two, getting back to your point, how do you bring people along? And the first thing you have to do is recognize that when you have somebody who is there deliberately to be mentored or to be brought in at a very junior level with the idea that you're investing in them and you're intending to use them down the road two or three years to replace some people that are moving off to other projects, that you shouldn't expect perfection on the first shot. And you've got to make sure that they get the experience, which means they make mistakes in a controlled fashion so that it's recoverable both, both for the mission you're on and for the person. You don't want somebody to have the opportunity to make a mistake so great that it's going to cost them a career. Um, the balance between that is always difficult to make. And you have to do it both understanding the person that you're trying to bring along, but also the resources and the people you have to mentor them or to be their leader or to be their team chief and make sure that they match. Or if they don't match, find a way to fill in what's needed. Um, because you, particularly on the longer missions, you have to have people cycling through people leaving to go to other opportunities and people coming in to learn something and hopefully be valuable to your mission, but if nothing else, be valuable to yeah, the laboratory. It's a life cycle. One of the benefits, I guess, of long missions is people can step in and see yeah. different things. Um, it's gone very fast. I'm getting an indicator that we're coming down to probably the final question already. And so one of the themes I see in, in questions here is advice. Advice for young professionals, advice for people who are joining uh, JPL. So what advice would you give uh, people who are starting out their career? Things to look to do or things to keep in mind? Uh, in any Well, um, the first thing I would say is be a little flexible about exactly what you want. Um, you're very unlikely to find the perfect job the first time you apply and you may have to sort of settle for something. But that doesn't mean that's a continual thing. That means your first step in the door is going to be what's available. When you go and actually say, okay, I've had an opportunity to do this job, and I can do it, I'm, I'm comfortable in it, you should almost immediately be saying, if I'm comfortable, maybe, maybe I've been there too long and I should be thinking about what I'd like to do next. And if nobody's helping you think about what you should do next, find somebody who will talk to you about it. And if, even if you don't have a clue, just start asking people. I'm thinking about a new job. 
what do you do that's interesting that I should possibly think about? And if the person can't tell you what's fun about his job, find somebody else, because there's lots of people that do enjoy what they do. Right, so be open to change. Uh, don't get comfortable, or if when you get comfortable, maybe it's a sign to look for different opportunities and speak to a lot of people. Jan? So one piece of advice that I give folks, which sounds counterintuitive, is to become dispensable in your job. You know, it really, I really resonate with Jim's comment about uh, people, when they reach the point of comfort in their job, they should look around. Well, they should also have made themselves dispensable so that they have someone who can step into their shoes and free them up to move on. Because I really encourage folks to look for breadth. Uh, we talked about breadth across the life cycle, you know, the, the formulation to development to operations, uh, breadth across um, in-house projects versus uh, partnered projects with a, a major contractor, uh, breadth across uh, the science domain, earth, planetary, astrophysics, human spaceflight, um, breadth across project and line management. So, you know, you, you don't need to think of, of rising up the, the management chain as your only measure of success. Really, we really value breadth and depth at JPL. Yeah, and that's come through in your discussions of the different roles and the, you know, the different areas. Um, it feels like, uh, to me, I've gotten comfortable with our discussion, so I guess Are you I should be looking to end. <laughs> uh, probably about as uh, unindispensable. <laughs> what am I trying to say? No, it's been uh, a very enjoyable discussion. I think we've hit on a lot of key things in terms of teaming, in terms of innovation, in terms of mentors. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't really get into that, but I think that, that comes clear. But I think from uh, both of your experiences, it's clear that you're both active in what you're doing, but also reflective in terms of learning what works and always looking for the, the next opportunity. So it's, it's been a pleasure. I wish we had a little bit more time. So, uh, But I'd like to thank both uh, Jim and Jan uh, for, uh, for their insights and their thoughts. I uh, want to thank uh, the folks here in terms of NASA TV and public relations at JPL and the knowledge uh, team of uh, David Orbehedinger and Min Lee for setting this up. And uh, thank you for joining.